Good evening. I'm Harvey Perlman, Chancellor of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the E.N. Thompson Forum on World Issues. Founded by and named in honor of E.N. Jack Thompson, the forum is designed to engage Nebraska students and Nebraskans in issues affecting the world around us. We are deeply grateful to the Thompson family and the Cooper Foundation for their continuing support of this series. We also thank the LEAD Center for its generous support, Nebraska Educational Telecommunications, Cable Channel 21, KRNU Radio, and the University Bookstore. Before I introduce this evening's speaker, let me remind you of our next forum for this season, Illegal Immigrants' Path to Citizenship, will be presented by Dr. Michael Olivas and Dr. Vernon Briggs on Wednesday, March 25th at 7 p.m. here at the LEAD Center. That forum is sponsored by the Charles and Linda Wilson Dialogue on Domestic Issues. At the conclusion of tonight's lecture, you will have the opportunity to ask questions of our speaker, and Dr. Will Norton, Dean of the College of Journalism and Mass Communications, will moderate the Q&A. Please write your questions on the cards and pass them to the ushers. Now it's my honor to introduce Sarah Chase. It's become a cliche to ask, what can you do with a liberal arts degree? Well, if you're Sarah Chase, you keep a country reeling from generations of warfare from sliding completely off the cliff. You leave a safe, if you call covering war zones safe, and secure position with the well-established National Public Radio, and start a non-governmental organization, Afghans for a Civil Society, with the brother of the newly elected president of the country. Under Ms. Jay's leadership, that NGO rebuilt a village destroyed under the during the anti-Taliban conflict, launched a successful income generation project for Kandahar women, launched the most popular radio station in southern Afghanistan, and conducted a number of policy studies. Later, she ran a dairy cooperative. She has launched a cooperative in Kandahar called Arghand, producing fine skincare products from local fruits, nuts, and botanicals. The aim is to discourage opium production by helping farmers earn a living from licit crops, as well as to encourage collective decision making. From this position, deeply embedded in Kandahar's everyday life, Ms. Chase has gained unparalleled insight into a troubled region. Her remarkable access to key players in the Afghan national government, U.S. military, local government officials, and tribal strongmen, coupled with her keen knowledge of the country's politics and culture, have positioned her as an expert voice in helping the world understand the complexities of Afghanistan. Her most recent book, The Punishment of Virtue, Inside Afghanistan After the Taliban, explores the intersection of U.S. policy, local corruption and violence, and an ancient tradition of tribal warlordism. Ms. Chase graduated in history from Harvard University in 1984, earning the Radcliffe College History Prize. She served in the Peace Corps in Morocco, then returned to Harvard to earn a master's degree in history and Middle Eastern studies, specializing in the medieval Islamic period. Her radio journalism career, which launched in 1991, earned her several notable awards. She has titled this evening's lecture, Notes from Afghanistan. Not only do I ask you to welcome her to the podium, but also to uh, congratulate her on having a birthday tomorrow, Ms. Shays. That was below the belt. <laughs> it's a real um, honor and pleasure to be here. It's been wonderful to be on campus uh, throughout the day. And I'm, I'm a little bit disconcerted because due to these lights, I actually can't see any of you folks. And it's very much my habit when I give a talk like this to, it's an interactive event. So I'm hoping that I will um, shortly adjust. Um, just a, a, a few further words before I launch um, what I wanted to say to give you a sense of the perspective from which I'm, I'm uh, speaking to you. And what, what basically happened was I was reporting the fall of the Taliban for National Public Radio. 
And it was the end of my rotation, and I um, was on my way out and was invited to dinner by one of my best uh, kind of behind the scenes sources. And he was not someone I ever put a microphone in front of, but he gave me really precious understanding of the cultural context in which the events I was reporting were taking place. And that was President Karzai's uncle, who is a real um, canny, funny, perceptive, deep gentleman. And he invited me to dinner, and um, we talked all about, you know, the, the uh, challenges that would be facing Afghanistan, in particular, actually corruption. Right back then, we were thinking about this humanitarian free-for-all, this, this kind of um, tidal wave, supposedly, of humanitarian development assistance that was going to break over Afghanistan. And he was saying they're sharpening their teeth and they're sharpening their knives already to get a piece of this. And anyhow, we had a really lovely evening. And I got up to leave, and he very um, uh, graciously, you know, took my coat to help me on with my coat. This is a Karzai family trait. And he said, he popped the question, as I'm walking out the door, wouldn't you come back and help us? Now, um, it has been one of my failings in life that I have a tendency to think with my mouth. And that's what I did. I said yes before I really processed um, what it was that, that this entailed. And so it has been a really interesting trajectory because it's included a really, um, I would say, um, rare combination of practice at a very grassroots level. My current cooperative includes 13 people. This is not um, macroeconomics. We are, we're a kind of demonstration. But there are 13 really ordinary Kandaharis, eight uh, women and five men, who work together, um, which in and of itself is a pretty... Um, um, uh, revolutionary thing for Kandahar, Afghanistan. And the men, for example, are from villages. They're, they're, uh, in those 13 people, we have nine different tribes and ethnic groups represented because um, we have a kind of non-nepotism um, uh, rule. So you don't, brothers and cousins and sisters-in-law do not get to uh, come join the cooperative. And so in a funny way, it does become this uh, microcosm of what's happening in Afghanistan. And, and through those experiences, and then um, you know, through contacts in both Afghan and, and, and international government officials, I can bring that kind of granular experience from the ground to the table to try to explain what, what the situation really is. Um, and so it's, it, it's not very kosher. To, to do humanitarian or development activity and do policy at the same time. You're not sort of supposed to do that, but I found that it's an extremely enriching way um, to, to try to make sense of this, pro of this um, problem. And so I guess given the incredible juncture in terms of Afghanistan, um, Afghanistan's life that we meet each other at, meaning, this is a couple of months into a new American administration that during its campaign um, made Afghanistan an important issue. I mean, it was, there was a very clearly stated appeal during the campaign that it's time for us to approach this problem differently and give it a little bit more focus than it's had in the past um, eight years. And, and, and yet, the policy of the new administration has not yet gelled. And so this turns out to be a really propitious moment to have this conversation. What I'd like to say is that on the one hand, I'm, I'm really excited by the level of talent, um, energy, and focus that already is being devoted to um, the problem in Afghanistan, in Washington. But I'm a little concerned, and, and what has given me pause in these early weeks of this administration has been a persistent message coming out of Washington saying, you know, we really need to lower our sights when it comes to Afghanistan. We need to reduce our expectations. Corollary, Afghan citizens need to reduce their expectations too. And this came in, in, in a flurry of declarations, um, both from within the administration and, and um, you know, from Congress and things like that. We're, we're hearing things like, well, we don't have any intention of turning Afghanistan into the 51st state, or there's no desire for an Afghan, a Central Asian Valhalla in Afghanistan. And first of all, those formulations I found really curious because whoever talked about making Afghanistan a 51st state? I mean, that was not... That was never in anyone's discourse. 
And when I spoke to some um, of, actually, some of the people who even said these things, I got these long involved explanations about how what we really have to do is, is make uh, the end state more clearly defined so that we'll know what success looks like. And, all the, and I started to feel like this is kind of like a joke where if you have to explain the punchline, your joke failed, <laughs> you know? And, and so, but, but what I gathered from what these folks were saying is that there had been, there, in their view, there had been a lot of inflated rhetoric under the previous administration about, um, you know, the democracy and state building that was going to happen in Afghanistan. And what I would like to submit is that that rhetoric was ancient history. I last heard about that rhetoric something like in February of 2002. And I remember on the ground, you know, we were all waiting for this Marshall Plan that was supposed to unfurl, just like President Karzai's uncle had suggested, was supposed to unfurl on Afghanistan. And I remember in the summer of 2002, we were saying, what are they waiting for? You know, what, when is this going to happen? And, and we were trying to come up with explanations for why it wasn't happening. You know, and one possible explanation was, well, you know, uh, the United States didn't yet want to invest in Afghanistan until President Karzai was officially enthroned as the interim president, which happened in June of 2002 and things like that. Well, it took a couple of years and some reporting on the war in Iraq before we came to understand that within two months of the fall of the Taliban regime, all of the resources and the talent and the planning and the focus and the energy was already diverted to Iraq. By February 2002 is when planning for Iraq started to happen. And I had thought from hearing President Obama's um, discussions of this issue during the campaign that he understood that that was the signal failing of the previous administration um, with respect to Afghanistan. It wasn't about having expectations too high. It was about an immediate shift in focus away from Afghanistan. Um, and so what I'm tempted to say tonight is poor old Afghanistan. You know, the first time the world forgot all about Afghanistan was after the Soviet withdrawal in 1989 when Afghanistan had, after all, been one of the most important battlefields in the Cold War. And a bunch of, you know, Afghan resistance fighters, granted uh, supplied by U.S. Stinger missiles and a lot of money, but they really had a major impact on, um, you know, the events that led to the demise of the Soviet Union. But we got so distracted by the fall of the wall and all of the things that ensued from the fall of the wall that Afghanistan got totally lost in the shuffle. And the second thing that distracted us from Afghanistan was Iraq. Well, now what we're getting distracted by is the specter, quite frankly, of US citizens standing on bread lines and selling apples in carts on street corners. In other words, we had the event that has come between the campaign period and, and, and this current period is an economic meltdown that is reminding us of the Great Depression. And it is certainly, I, I certainly understand that in that context, um, when you just wrote a check for a trillion dollars of, of um, economic um, recovery, having written a check for $700 billion um, prior to that, having written a check for $700 billion for the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, it's a little bit harder to sell, as it were, um, continued and increased focus and resources and attention and energy devoted to Afghanistan. I would like to... Um, um, submit that um, it would be a mistake not, not to do that for um, uh, a number of reasons, and we'll, and we'll get to that. But so now what you're starting to hear, you're, you know, you're hearing things like the 51st state and the Central Asian Valhalla, and you're hearing things like, you know, Afghanistan is a country that really hates international interference, so we better get out of there as fast as possible. We hear that Afghans are really just a tribal people, you know? They, they, they've never really been governed. They, they can't be governed, in fact. And what were we even thinking about trying to impose, you know, government from the central and democracy on a people that just really doesn't want it or uh, isn't ready for it or something like that? 
And, and we start to hear that it's actually the United States national interest in Afghanistan. It, it, it's, it's a really limited national interest. It's only about eradicating sanctuaries for transnational terrorism. Let me take these on, if I may, one by one. Um, in Afghanistan, which is sandwiched between, uh, or has for a long time been sandwiched between uh, competing superpowers, outside influence has tended to take the form of being conquered or attempts at being conquered. Um, you know, for example, by the British Raj throughout most of the 19th century, or by the Soviet Union in the 1980s. And I would submit that, you know what, if that's what international involvement and influence looks like, we probably wouldn't like it very much either. But the fact is that um, international influence and involvement, when, they, when Afghans see it as part of their national development and helpful to them and helpful in reinserting them into the community of nations is something they are very much in favor of. And I drove into Kandahar, Afghanistan, the den of Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden and stuff like that, um, and, and Mullah Omar, I mean, several days after the fall of the Taliban regime. And I am telling you, I did not experience any hostility whatsoever as a representative of the international community or let alone as an American female driving a car uh, unveiled. And, you know, okay, fair enough. They didn't exactly throw off their burqas and, you know, uh, uh, line up in um, barber shops and stuff like that. Although the lines in front of music cassette booths were pretty impressive. Um, uh, Kandaharis are a sober people, and they're also a cautious people, having lived through 30 years nearly now of combat. And so there was a certain amount of concern, what is it that we are going to experience here? Um, but the enthusiasm for the Karzai, the young regime of President Karzai, the enthusiasm for the involvement by, you know, a couple of dozen um, of the most developed and, and um, constructive, in their view, countries in the world, was greeted with 100% enthusiasm. Uh, so that's um, what happened thereafter is something I'll get into. But that's the first point. The second point about tribalism. Um, I think a much more accurate and useful way of thinking about tribal social structures in Afghanistan is more like dual citizenship. And this is something we all experience as Americans. You know, I'm a citizen of the state of Massachusetts and I'm a citizen of the United States of America. And if you ask me, are you an American or are you a citizen of Massachusetts? I wouldn't understand the question because those two things are not in conflict. Um, I'm fiercely loyal as a New Englander and all that stuff, and I understand that the state of Massachusetts has jurisdiction over certain aspects of my life, and the United States of America has jurisdiction over other aspects of my life. And that's really how the Afghans that I live among experience their tribal identities. They, they don't see that in conflict with their fierce loyalty to Afghanistan as a nation. Now, um, what does happen is that the tribal social structure has turned out to be a successful survival strategy when their nation state comes under attack, as it has in a number of uh, cases in the 19th and 20th centuries. And so quite interestingly, something like the Soviet Union will capture the central government and assume that they got the country. And the tribal social structures serve as something that the Afghans can fall back on as a platform for resistance. Um, and so they are precious in that regard. And, and, and it's a cliche to say that Afghans only unite when they come under attack. A closer look will indicate that they actually dissolve when they come under attack. They dissolve back down to those tribal um, uh, structures. Um, but every single Afghan that I have met in seven and a half years living there um, does not look to tribal structures as the optimal form of government. That's not something that should govern them. It, again, has a certain role. For example, if I get into a conflict with somebody else in my tribe over land, for example, well, I'd probably rather take that to our tribal elders so that we can air our dirty laundry in family. You know, we might not take that case to the government courts because we can settle it 
ourselves using our traditional structures. There's nothing in that process that is in conflict with being governed from the center. Um, and every Afghan that I have ever met, spoken to, uh, spent time with, harks back to the period throughout most of the last century during which Afghanistan was governed from the center by a proper government institution that had monopoly on the use of force, uh, that could send a police officer to a village to bring a suspect for, an, you know, in a criminal investigation to town for, you know, this kind of thing. And, and, and they saw our arrival in Afghanistan as offering the opportunity to develop that kind of um, a government that was not tainted by religious extremism. Um, the notion that, third point, the notion that um, really the US national interest is only, it, it is kind of confined to the eradication of bases for transnational terrorism in Afghanistan. What I would submit is that was precisely the way the Afghanistan problem was approached by the previous administration. Um, it was almost a kind of cowboys in Al-Qaeda. I watched it happening. In fact, as a reporter, I actually joined one of these posses, you know, where you kind of gallop off. I mean, okay, we were in pickup trucks, we weren't on horses, but it really was, you know, let's gallop off and chase um, Al-Qaeda with a posse. And, all right, we're in Nebraska, right? But uh, <laughs> in the Western movies, um, the posse is always made up of John Wayne. You know, they're these upstanding, handsome, um, um, you know, specimens of male American uh, humanity, right? With stars on their chest and things like that. Well, I suspect um, that in real life, posses actually were much closer to resembling the outlaws they were chasing than we would like to admit. And that's precisely what we did in 2002, is that we needed some proxies, some posses, to go galloping off Al-Qaeda hunting with us. And what we did was seek out those people who were most likely to have a gripe with the Taliban. And, and what had happened, so let me just take a couple of steps back and say that um, during the Soviet occupation, uh, as I said, Afghanistan kind of fell back onto its tribal structures as a platform to fight back against the Soviets. That was a decade, right? And that was a decade during which the United States via Pakistan funneled a whole lot of money into these tribal structures and it funneled countless weapons, including Stinger missiles and stuff like that. And so to use another metaphor, what I'd say is that the tribal structures almost develop like cancer tumors so that those tribal leaders who had been accessible to their, to their villages and their communities in a democratic fashion where they were kind of first among equals, which is how a Afghan indigenous dem democracy works, um, kind of grew beyond the capacity of the Afghan body politic to rein, to rein them in, like cancer cells. And you could look at the arrival of the Taliban in 1994 as something like a very painful operation that Afghanistan had to undergo in order to cut those cancer cells out of the body politic. And that's one of the things that the Taliban did for which they remained appreciated. Uh, especially in the Afghan South afterwards, was they threw the warlords out of town. They killed them or they exiled them. And so what did we do in, in 2001 is we basically, to, to, to extend the medico metaphor, we took a syringe, uh, sucked up the cancer cells and re-injected them into the body politic. To go back to the other metaphor, the posse metaphor, we, we got these warlords who had been banished from the country and we made them our proxies in the fight to eradicate the sanctuaries for transnational terrorism. And that might have made some sense militarily. But the next problem was we installed them in positions of political power. And I, again, watched this happening. And to my dumbfounded amazement, I watched US Special Forces basically help one of these thugs take control over Kandahar militarily when President Karzai was already in um, possession of the town and had appointed somebody else to be governor of the province. And I'm saying, wait a second. 
We are supporting President Karzai as the president of this country. He has been named in the Bonn Conference and all that stuff, and he has made a presidential decision, which is to appoint uh, so-and-so to be governor of, of Kandahar, and we are now supporting this other warlord to take the governorship away by force from that guy. And I said, oh my God, this is gonna be um, a nightmare. And in fact, I wanted that to be the first story that I filed upon my arrival in Kandahar. And NPR actually was not interested in that story. They said, well, we'll get into intra-Afghan intra rivalries later on. We want you to do Mullah Omar sightseeing. And my position was, uh, they didn't put it that way. They said, go to Mullah Omar's house and tell us what it looks like and all that stuff. And my position was, um, <laughs> we, we, we should have done the Mullah Omar, star, st Mullah Omar story back in 1998 you know, not, let alone 1996. Um, but that was when that was a really important story. Now we all know what a terrible fellow he is. This is the story that is going to determine what the next couple of years looks like. And indeed, that's exactly what, what proved to be the case. And um, so what we did is we put these folks in positions of power and we didn't pay any attention to how they were governing. All we paid attention to was how much they were helping us chase Al-Qaeda. Um, and so I saw surreal um, situations, like in those very, very early days still, I went to visit the hospital in Kandahar, which was an abomination. Um, but I went to visit it because there were still about 10 Al-Qaeda holdouts sitting there. I mean, it was classic with the, you know, grenades that they were cradling against their stomachs. And I mean, it was, you know. And, and, and while I was there, I saw a young boy about nine years old get wheeled into the, um, to the hospital with most of his, the top of his arm shot off. And, and I said, what happened? And his father said, well, he was, this was during Ramadan when, when you can't eat, drink, smoke, or do some other things between dawn and dusk. And um, he had noticed that one of the militia members of, one of, of this same guy who stole the governorship was smoking. Kid, nine-year-old kid, why are you breaking your fast? That's what he asked. And the guy leveled his Kalashnikov and shot off half of the kid's upper arm. And this militiaman was dressed in a US Army uniform that had been issued to him. And this was the issue, this was the problem for the Afghan population throughout 2002 is they were really concerned about the security situation. There were no Taliban in southern Afghanistan. There weren't any, they were gone. The security problems that the population were fa was, was facing were caused by the militias that had been put together by these proxies that we were using, by these warlords that we were using in our anti-Al-Qaeda fight. And uh, they were shaking people down, they were kidnapping people for ransom, they were um, stealing people's land, they were arrogating um, the lucrative contracts with the American military base, they were all of that stuff. And frankly, from that day to this, we have um, not called any of these people to account. We have been supporting them with our moral support, with our weaponry, with our uh, money, and never asking them how they are treating, how they are governing their population. And so you're in this kind of surreal situation where we're saying, oh, this is an Afghan government, we can't interfere, you know? The Afghans don't like it when you interfere with their government. And the Afghans are saying, what Afghan government? You brought these people here, you installed them in power over us, you have given them free reign over us, and now you expect us to be able to redress this balance? We need you to call these dogs to heal. And this is this kind of um, cognitive dissonance that I've been trying to bridge for years and I cannot get a lot of the international officials to get their heads around um, um, this, this issue. And so that's why I get a little bit concerned when I hear uh, the new American administration saying maybe we should just treat Afghanistan as a narrow counterterrorism, you know, um, uh, campaign and forget about all the rest. Because I say, wait a second, that's what we've been doing for the last seven years. And here's what the result has been. The result is that in 2002, the sanctuaries for international terrorism in, in Afghanistan were a couple of hilltops on the very far eastern fringes of the country. 
And today, you've got almost half the country that is a potential sanctuary for international terrorism because, because the Taliban basically holds sway in one degree. It's a, it's a fluid kind of thing. It's not like they control territory like a government. But, but they hold very significant sway over about half the country. And if you believe that in five or 10 years, that is not going to potentially be a sanctuary for international terrorism, you're absolutely fooling yourself and you're missing the um, lesson of, um, of prior decades. And so I, I really find it confusing to hear this administration um, beginning to just about um, echo the policy of the previous administration and somehow, I guess, try to sell this to us as change. And so what I'd like to finish up by talking about is what do we need in Afghanistan? The very first thing that we need uh, in Afghanistan is some of that, yes, we can. Yes, we can provide the kind of government that Afghans were crying out for when we arrived in 2001. What does that start to look like? Um, um, in a, in, a, in a gritty and concrete sort of way. Number one, troops. Yes, we do need more troops, and that may sound counterintuitive, but I'd just like to, I'd like to dwell on that for a second, and, and first of all point out that by comparison to Kosovo in uh, uh, 1999, there is one, one 20th of the troop de density per population in Afghanistan as there was in Kosovo in 1999. Um, this is a grievously under-resourced um, theater, if you will, um, when I would argue that the strategic significance to what the whole world is going to look like in the 21st century of Afghanistan compared to Kosovo is much higher. So you're not talking about turning, by sending 17,000 or even 30,000 more troops to Afghanistan, that is not turning Afghanistan into an armed camp. Secondly, and this is something that was really counterintuitive to me, but that I c came to understand by watching it, it actually turns out that more troops can have a lighter footprint than less troops. And there are a couple of ways that I've seen this play out. One is that there was a situation a year ago, October, where a very critical and beautiful district just north of Kandahar City was going to come under attack by the Taliban. And this is an attack from outside. The population of that district did not want the Taliban there. They had had a tribal elder who was very powerful and very well respected in the community, and he had held that place. And he had scared the Taliban and prevented them from making moves. And he died of a heart attack a year ago, October. And I literally went to the Canadian commander, the one-star general who, it's a, it's a Canadian lead in Kandahar province, and I said, um, Guy, he's French-Canadian, um, you are going to have an attack on Argonaut District within the next couple of weeks. And he kind of looked at me and said, oh, I was going to focus on Argonaut, but I don't have the men. I cannot move the men from where they are currently deployed and move them to prevent an attack on Argonaut. And, and I had talked to some of these old resistance fighters and actually gotten some tactics. You know, I asked them, you guys know how to fight here. You, you know, you fought here for a decade. How would you do it? And they explained exactly where you would put the kind of little um, forward operating bases or something like that, little, little outposts that were in the desert where there isn't any habitation or anything like that. And you could see where the Taliban would be coming down from if they're coming down from the north. And you'd be able to cut them off before they reach the district of Argandab. But that Canadian commander simply didn't have the men to do it. And sure enough, exactly two weeks after the death of Mullah Naqib, the Taliban attacked Argandab district. They got inside the district. Then, of course, the Canadians had to counterattack. But then they were counterattacking in a heavily populated, um, beautifully, it's, a, it's an orchard area, so it's full of pomegranate orchards and stuff like that. And they're destroying trees and they're hurt, you know, um, damaging buildings and stuff like that. So Having too few troops means that sometimes you do more damage than if you have no, more troops. And the other point um, in that regard is you use heavier ordnance, getting very technical, but um, there are cases where you've got, you know, um, um, you know a, a unit of troops that are being fired on by a 
you know, a couple of guys in a machine gun and they don't have enough infantry to deal with it in an infantry fashion, so they call down a 500 pound bomb, you know, literally on three guys with a machine gun. First of all, it's really expensive. And second of all, if there are civilians around, you can guarantee that civilians are gonna get killed. So more troops, but um, it's really important for the troops to have a different focus from what they've had in the past. And, and what I do have to say that's been really impressive to me is to watch how the United States Army has evolved, particularly in about the last two or three years. And it turns out that you know when you are an officer and you're losing men, you don't like it and you start to get self-critical. And that's what I've seen in the US Army. It has been absolutely visible. And, and the quality and the, and the type of thinking and the approach of US military officers who are deploying to Afghanistan today is completely different from what it was five years ago. And that's because of they took a drubbing in Iraq. They really did. And so they realized, we got to change our approach. And what they changed it to is much less of an enemy focus. Oh, let's go hunt and kill the bad guy. And much more of a population-oriented approach, which means you think about how you can protect and assist the population rather than how you can deploy yourself to, to, to kill the bad guys. Now, it's a work in progress. Um, I can't say that it's fully um, um, you know, permeated down to the lowest levels and things like that, but this really is a genuine change in thinking that I've been observing, and I've watched it all the way to the level of um, I had a battalion commander, a friend of mine, who um, um, he's still deployed, he's way out on the eastern part of the country. And first of all, one of the things he does is there is no, um, there is no fire by, by artillery in his battalion that he does not personally order. Because he said, you know what, I don't want some company co commander to have that on him if he orders, you know, an artillery barrage and somebody gets killed. So that's the first thing. And I have watched him do this, and I've watched this guy make these decisions and the basis on which he makes the decisions. And once he, um, he did order some mortar fire and seven civilians were killed. And we're friends. And, and, and so I got the email traffic and he wrote to me. And he was devastated, and you could feel it in his, in his email. He was absolutely devastated. There were kids among those seven people. And he said, I've got the pictures of my kids on my desk, and I just killed kids who are the same age as, as my own children. And so that was one letter. And then the next letter, he told me what he had decided to do about this. And what he did was he um, actually gathered local um, officials and tribal elders to the place where his men were, when they asked him to call down this, you know, to, 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 uh, to call for this mortar fire. And he explained, here's where my men were, here's where the Taliban were, here's what the Taliban were doing. The Taliban broke contact and went, you know, over in that direction, and that's been a typical further secondary ambush site of theirs, and here's what I did. So, so that was one. And then he went to the home that had been hit, and he actually sat with the family, and he prayed for those dead um, civilians. And the family at the end of this experience um, forgave him. And I think that that kind of an attitude to um, things that do happen in war would make an enormous difference in Afghanistan. And, and I think that that sort of attitude is not something that I saw three, four, or five years ago. Um, the other thing that we need to do is mentoring and partnering with um, Afghan military units, that's already happening and it's been very successful. I watched the Afghan National Army deploy to southern Afghanistan and it was a disaster. Um, they were doing the same thing. They were beating people up. They were stealing things from shops. They were, most of them were from the northern part of the country and so they actually didn't speak Pashto, which is our language in southern Afghanistan. And it's, I even find it offensive when I get stopped by an army officer and he starts addressing me in, in Dari, which is not the local language. And he's a little bit gruff when I can't answer him in Dari and I can't answer him in Pashto, you know. And I'll give it back to him and I say, hey, don't you speak the language, you know. But, but Pashtuns were experiencing actually quite a bit of um, 
discrimination on the part of the Afghan National Army. And, and, and one of the things that NATO and US forces have done is put embedded mentors and trainers into the Afghan National Army, and the difference is unbelievable in a period of two years. This is the most professional branch of Afghan government. And the Afghan population has turned around on it, loves the army because of their professionalism and the way they treat the population. And so what I started wondering is, let's see, why is it intrinsically harder to be a lieutenant, for example, in the Afghan National Army than it is to be a mayor or to be the head of the public health department for Kandahar province or something like that? Let's get some, um, you know, embedded mentors in with um, civilians. Let's, and I'm going to come back to that in a second um, because I jumped my own gun just a little bit. But basically what we need to really think about is what's always come last, which is governance. You keep hearing we're going to do security first to create space for governance. Instead, we need to change our focus to look at governance first because when the Afghan population is happy with the way they're being treated by their government officials, they're going to pull away from the Taliban anyway. They're going to pull away. The only reason that they're beginning to sidle over to the Taliban is because, once again, just like back in 1994, it's the only apparent option or alternative to the reigning chaos that they are currently experiencing. Um, so you focus on governance first, and you get all sorts of cascading positive effects. Um, another way of doing that is um, redress of grievances. For example, in Kandahar right now, um, uh, a very important government official has expropriated 600 acres of land and what he's doing right now is he is trying to sell it off at one-tenth the market value in exchange for a vote for President Karzai. So you both have theft of land and you have distortion of the electoral process and nobody, none of us, no, none of the international community is saying anything about this. Um, so one of the things I've suggested is, is putting together kind of committees for the redress of grievances. And you have to have a heavy international presence on those committees. Um, because Afghans are not in, um, a, you know, they're, they're just, the balance of power is so heavily tilted against them that they can't stick their necks out and, and, and achieve any redress on their own. But if you put the you know, military commander, the State Department representative or the, um, you know, NATO ally uh, equivalent thereof, development agency representative on that committee, four or five Afghans of stature and independence and, and respect in the community for their integrity, give them some police resources who would get some training in criminal investigations instead of just counterterrorism, you know, and collect and vet grievances against the government. And when you get big ones like this land grab, which is, which is affecting a whole village and by extension its tribe, you take that on and you start by simply putting pressure on the Afghan official concerned. And, and I've experienced this because I've done it um, with the previous governor of Kandahar where he was, um, again, it was a land issue that had to do with the manufacturers and, and obtaining title deed to land in the industrial zone. And I cajoled this guy. I mean, we had a relationship, and, and, and you know, so I could kind of get away with this in a way that uh, Afghans certainly couldn't. And I brought this up to him. First of all, I had access to him. I could come see the guy whenever I wanted to, which Afghans couldn't. And I said, look, you, you need to uh, work on this issue. And he said, I, I don't want to talk about it. And I said, you have to. You're the governor, and this is your job. You have to talk about land in the industrial zone. And he said, OK, OK, I'll call you tomorrow. And I said, uh-uh. And I actually went to his desk and took his calendar off his desk, and I said, oh, you are free at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. I will see you at 11 o'clock, and I'm going to have some uh, manufacturers in tow. And that's what started out the process. Then I didn't govern for him. I just, you know, by constantly asking the question. So then I let the manufacturers negotiate the issue and work it. But I would keep calling into them and saying, hey, how's that thing going? And it was funny because I would hear, oh, it's going great. We thank you so much. You know, now it's just in the, you know, registry of public deeds office. And then I'd go away for a month and I'd call back and I'd say, where's your, uh, you know, where's your land title issue? And they say, 
you know what, it actually clogged up in the Registry of Public Deeds office. You know, so then I'd have to call the governor again, and I would say, you know what, this issue has clogged up in the, you know. It took 15 months to solve it, uh, and it took a fired mayor to solve it, but we did get it solved, and I would submit that had I been, had I had a couple of stars up here, things probably would have gotten settled a lot faster than, you know, as um, Sarah the soap maker, right? Uh, um, so committees for redress that are backed up then by, you know, so what they do is they provide the grist for the guy with stars to bring up to uh, the governor. Let's say the governor has a direct line to President Karzai, which some of them do, and the governor calls President Karzai. Then what happens? What you need to have, this is where political determination comes in. This has to be a policy of the United States government so that that one-star general who may own, you know, whatever, be, be, be in charge of five provinces, he's got a direct line to the ambassador. And the ambassador accepts that when one of these grievances gets clogged up at the national level, the ambassador will push it with President Karzai. And I am telling you that just that degree of pressure will have an enormous impact on the behavior of Afghan government officials. And then we don't have to get into the kingmaking game. We don't have to get into the game of, is it, should, should it be President Karzai or should it be somebody else or should it be this governor or that governor? Because you kind of put screws in whichever governor you know, happens to be present at the time. And this makes a lot of international officials very uncomfortable because we go back to the Afghans don't like interference from abroad uh, story. And again, I would just like to reiterate, the, Afghan, the Afghans are crying out for this. I have been, been kind of talking about this redress of grievances thing for a couple of years now. And international officials all tell me, oh, we can't possibly do that. We can't interfere so much with the Afghan government. And the Afghans are saying, please, oh my God, this would be the greatest thing if you guys would set this up. So that's one of the types of mechanisms that, that you know, could be. Um, and then let me come back to um, civilian mentors. Um, President Obama, in his inaugural address, um, made a really moving plea. It wasn't quite asked not what your country can do for you, but it was in that vein about service and not always just thinking about what we're going to do to advance our own careers or whatever it might be, but are there ways that we can serve either in this country or outside this country? What I would love him to do is make that notion concrete with respect to Afghanistan and put out an appeal for, let's start with 100, that's not a lot. I want 100 former US mayors, um, uh, heads of public health departments, heads of electricity departments, US attorneys, I've got a US attorney, so all I need is 99. I've got the US attorney for the eastern half of the state of Kansas. Um, and, and I want, people who are about to retire or recently retired. And I want us to make this appeal to our NATO partners too, instead of banging our fist on the table and saying, you Germans are really cowards because you won't send combat troops to the Afghan South. You know what? That's not gonna work. And you know what? The Netherlands, which has sent troops to the Afghan South, is at the limit of its capacity in terms of what it can do militarily. Um, and there are public opinion issues that our NATO partners are facing. And I think we need to be a little bit more sympathetic to those issues. But you know what Europeans really know how to do beautifully is run cities and run you know, uh, water agencies based on um, river watersheds and stuff like that. Let's give me 20 from each of five European NATO um, member countries. And let's put together a kind of senior core that will go to Afghanistan and spend a year or two years mentoring. We can do, with 200 people, we can easily do five pilot provinces. And that will be such an extraordinary um, um, kind of um, demonstration of what it is that, that, that we really do have to offer. And, and I submit that only by going this broad spectrum route are we ever going to durably reduce the sanctuaries for international terrorism in Afghanistan. Um, I would, I would um, this is something we can get into in, in question and answer, but my own feeling about what Afghanistan is about is much broader than just sanctuaries for international terrorism. It really has to do with what kind of a century we want to live in. 
And we just came through a century that was about with us or against us, that was about um, um, clash of civilizations. Back then, remember, it was communism and capitalism, and that was the big clash of civilizations. Well, isn't it funny that the second communism falls, we suddenly have a brand new clash of civilizations, right? I don't believe in that way of thinking about the world. I believe that we are a collection of intimately and intricately intertwined civilizations that have things to learn from and teach each other. And we are not going to defeat each other's civilizations. And so what I think Afghanistan is about is can we through how Afghanistan and of course Iraq also, but uh, I don't live there, um, can we move the direction that we're, we're taking in this century toward interconnectedness and not us against them. So I actually think the stakes are even higher than international terrorism. But even if you say the stakes are, are just international terrorism, you got to go broad spectrum and then you're going to get an interconnected world. So the benefits are, are much wider also. Thank you very much, all of you, for coming. Thank you very, very, very much. While they're collecting the other questions, Sarah, let's begin with a, set of, with a question from the Ian Thompson scholars. You have lived and worked in Afghanistan as a reporter, an NGO worker, and a business owner. In which role do you think you have made the greatest difference in Afghanistan? Hmm. Um, probably my current one. Um, but the point, as I think you guys have gathered, is that I don't just ever wear one hat. Um, and, and that may have to do with my own um, makeup, psychological makeup. But I am a business, I wouldn't say owner because we're a cooperative, but I'm kind of a business mentor. Um, but there's a tendency, you know, it, even professionally, to sort of be in lanes. Like you can only be a business person. You can't be, a, let's say, a commentator uh, or a journalist. Now, I'm clearly not a journalist anymore because, you know, journalists, like, they're sort of like God. You know, they're omniscient and invisible and stuff like that. And, uh, um, uh, and I, don't, I don't function uh, that way now, but I do write articles. Um, th it's kind of turning the journalism paradigm on its head. Instead of being invisible and omniscient, what I say is I'm not omniscient and, and I'm visible. Here's where I am in the picture. It's like I'm on, you know, the 10th row back, six seat over from the right. And from this perspective, this is what I see. Um, so I'm able to both be involved in the business world and learn a lot about what's going wrong in Afghanistan. Let me tell you, we just brought in solar equipment because to this day there's still only five, four, five, six hours of electricity every two days in Kandahar, the second most important city in Afghanistan, eight years on, and we're talking economic development. Like, Try expanding your business um, in that kind of an environment. So we got the Canadians, the uh, Canadian Overseas Devel uh, International Development Agency, to spring for a major um, solar, um, uh, um, you know, array. It cost close to $1,000 in bribes to get the thing in from the border. Now, if I had been in town, I would not have paid the bribes, but I wasn't there, you know. Um, and so you experience, as a business person, the dysfunctionalities in the, in, in the system. But then I get to do this kind of thing. I get to tell you about it. And, and I might get to write about it and things like that. And, and I guess that's part of why this role has, has been very important. And secondarily, I would say that in spite of the concern that I just expressed to you guys about 
about the direction I, I or some of the things that I'm hearing emanating from Washington. Let me tell you, the um, contrast between Washington over the last seven years and the Washington since January 21 is indescribable. For seven years, there was nobody home. I literally could not find. <laughs> Find me the locus of decision making on Afghanistan in Washington. There, was, there weren't none. Um, now, being in Washington is sort of like, I am speck of dust. Washington is bionic vacuum cleaner. You know, I mean, it is incredible. And so there's also a change in the outside um, environment. How are you still alive? Um, one way of dealing with warlords is you push them around. And then they assume that, God, if she's acting like that, she must have a predator flying. <laughs> <laughs> so what I have come to understand is that mutually assured destruction remains um, um, an active doctrine in Afghanistan. And I have actually had to resort to it. Um, in other words, I have had a couple of death threats um, dressed up to look like Taliban death threats. Um, but in fact, they were coming from the governor of Kandahar. And when I figured that out, I sent some uh, heavy artillery his way to explain that, um, that it would be distressing to certain people that if I were to die. Um, and so that's part of it. But um, um, what that does imply, and I actually had to think about this question because somebody else asked it to me in a very persistent way and forced me to think it out. And what that helped me to understand is that this Taliban thing is not an indigenous um, um, insurrection. Because if this were an indigenous, ideologically uh, oriented insurrection, I would be dead because somebody would figure out I don't have barbed wire or, or you know, uh, sandbags or anything like that. I'm the softest target in Kandahar. And somebody would have decided that the ticket to heaven was to kill the American lady who, who drives around with a big mouth, you know. Um, and therefore, what that implies is that there's a lot of um, control over this operation. And that control is exercised across the border in Pakistan. And let's just look at the calculus a little bit. The United States government is providing a billion dollars a year to the Pakistani military, which is uh, on the side fomenting the Taliban um, resurgence, right? If a lot of American civilians started showing up dead, maybe Washington would re-examine its Pakistan policy. So quite interestingly, up until 2007, not a single American civilian was touched. Not a single British civilian was touched. Not a single Canadian civilian was touched. Ironically, the people, the civilians who were getting targeted were from the very organizations and countries that you would have expected would not be targeted. It was the ICRC. Tell me, find me a more neutral. They actually provide medical care to the, to the Taliban. Why did they get assassinated? Doctors Without Borders, the French, the Germans, and things like that. And that's what really one of the data points that convinced me further of the Pakistani involvement in this uh, Taliban so-called resurgence. Now our policy is beginning to change, and so I'm a little bit more mobile, let's say, than I used to be. How can we best influence our leaders individually and collectively to push forward this vision of Afghanistan which you have detailed? Uh, I think this is a very pregnant moment, a very propitious moment for just that. If you had asked me this question a year ago, I have to say I would have shrugged my shoulders because, again, I wouldn't have known who, who was making the decisions. Now, what I would honestly advise you all to do is get out you know, your pens and, and, and papers, pieces of paper. And I would write letters in particular to uh, where a lot of the decision making is going to happen is in the State Department. Um, Ambassador Holbrook is going to be a phenomenally powerful um, um, member of, of, of this team. I think the State Department, um, um, Secretary Clinton. Um, there's an issue that we haven't gotten into yet, which, which we may in the questions, which is negotiating with the Taliban. I think that um, if you followed my drift up till now, you'll see that negotiating the, with the Taliban is not relevant to this problem because we're not dealing with an indigenous insurgency like Hamas or like the IRA. We're dealing really with something that belongs to Pakistan. So if you want to cede part of Afghanistan to Pakistan, 
You know, that's another issue. That's something you might do through negotiations. But let me remind you that if, uh, the, the, if there is some kind of deal of power for peace with the Taliban, guess who's going to get sold out? The women. And I suspect that Hillary Clinton is not going to be very anxious to be part of a program that is going to sell the female population of Afghanistan downriver. So she might be an interesting person to send a letter to. Um, I think the White House also, and oddly enough, CENTCOM. General Petraeus answers his mail. Um, and so you might consider writing to General Petraeus. Uh, Congress, obviously, and um, newspapers. I've found that the New York Times is taking a pretty ideological bent on this thing, and they could use um, they could use some um, uh, redirection from their readership. What is the role, if any, of China and Afghanistan? And a second question: And where do we and questions? where do we sign up for the Senior Corps? All right. Thank you. Yes, second questions of that order are allowed. Um, China, um, I don't have much experience of Chinese influence in Afghanistan. There is some, but it tends to be economic. So, for example, there is a copper mine in the east uh, of Afghanistan that I think China has bought. I don't know exactly what the details of the um, contract are and things like that, but that is an issue where, again, these are natural resources of the country. I would love to look at that contract and see what rights they got for how much money and where that money went to and whether it's really um, 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 having as much of an impact on the Afghan budget as it ought to. I mean, mineral resources of that country are getting thrown away and, and, and shouldn't be. But I don't see a desire on the part of China to, to kind of take over part of the Afghan uh, uh, Afghan you know, part of Afghanistan um, directly or by proxy the way I do by Pakistan. I also don't see that on the part of Iran. Iran is much more economically active on the western part of the country, but it really is an effort to subjugate the Afghan economy to the Iranian economy. That I see much more than I see arms shipments or anything like that. Senior Corps, watch this space. I'm working it really hard, and, and so, um, um, I might leave my email address and have you write into me, but but I'm work. I, I really think that, and, and I'm really glad you asked the question because another thing I keep hearing from officials when I suggest it to them is nobody would do that, and I say post the jobs in. 300 million Americans, we are going to come up with 100 talented, experienced, dedicated people who can make a difference. What are you talking about? Are we that, you know, are, 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 are we that bereft now of inspiration and adventurism? And, and I can't believe it. I just don't believe it. So thanks for asking that. What possible alternative cash crop could compete with or supplant the traditional opium trade Given the limitations of high elevation environment, the demands of warlord factionalism, Carlisle, Karzai's endemically corrupt regime, and the urgencies framed by its, Afghan, by its recent past, Afghan's recent past. Um, first of all, opium is not a traditional crop in Afghanistan. It really uh, started to make headway in order to finance the, uh, uh, in, uh, the um, independence struggle against the, or the resistance against the Soviets. So this is a relatively recent uh, addition to Afghanistan. Opium is an economic issue. Um, but it turns out that lots of things compete with opium, including this year wheat, because the, price, the world price of wheat has gone up so high and the labor requirements for opium are so high that uh, wheat even competes with opium uh, fairly well right now. What really competes with opium is fruit. Um, and um, here's the problem, is that when you plant a pomegranate sapling, you don't get fruit for five years. So what does the family live on for, the, for five years? It seems to me if we care about the opium issue, we subsidize those five years. And I submitted this as a project idea to the Canadian International Development Asso uh, Agency. 11 months of excruciating design and redesign of, con of concepts and you know all of that stuff, monitoring other people's similar projects and, until they decided we can't give direct payments to farmers. Why not? 
Why not? You know, do we care about opium or not? Now, there are other aspects to the trade that are, that are, that are also important. If you plant, if you blanket southern Afghanistan in fruit trees, um, then you get a glut. So you have to start looking at uh, downstream transformations. That's part of what argon is about. What else can you turn fruit into? First of all, you make it more possible to export fruit. There's plenty of market for that quality of fruit throughout the world. We've got such stringent phytosanitary standards that it amounts to protectionism. It's not just about health. It's about keeping other people out. So that's something you can work on. You can work on packaging and hygiene for uh, fruit, dried fruit, nuts, et cetera, in uh, Afghanistan. You can um, work on processing. Afghanistan imports packaged pomegranate juice from Iran when it is the pomegranate capital of the world. You know, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, then there's a credit issue. Let's have a show of hands in this room. How many of you do not own a credit card? Okay, I think we've got the student body in the middle. So <laughs> those of you who are under the age of 25 are disqualified. Um, then we get to where we're at about 10 people in this room don't have credit cards. Well, guess what? Afghans have just as much of a cash flow plot problem as we do, if not more. And um, they don't have any access to credit, except the local, there's the op opium trafficker, right? I borrow $1,000 from my uh, friendly neighborhood opium trafficker. He requires me to pay back in opium, not interested in cash. I want opium, and I want opium at half the market value. Um, this is my friendly neighborhood crop eradicator who comes by with spray and treats the opium issue as a noxious weed infestation and eradicates my uh, crop, right? And does the trafficker forgive my debt? Nuh-uh. He actually doubles it, and so I have to plant twice as much opium the next year. So that's where um, you need to look at the economic structure of the problem. And it doesn't, it turns out to be more complex, but to some extent more dealable with than simply opium is more valuable than other crops. There are tons of other valuable crops. So you start doing contract farming. That's what we do with Rosa, Rosa Damascena. It's a variety of rose that you get rose oil from. And other herbs and flowers that we extract the essential oils. We actually contract with farmers. However much of the stuff you want to grow, we'll buy it and we'll buy it at you know, the market rate for rose petals, which ends up being a return similar to opium. So this is a, de you know, it is a, an addressable problem, but there's no magic bullets. It's a multifaceted, um, development-oriented um, solution, which has not been started yet. We haven't started doing any of these things, and we're eight years on. So it's, it's painful to see the amount of wasted time. One more question, and I'm sorry about only it's asking. the long answers. <laughs> I'm sorry for my long answers. I should have said inverted pyramid. <laughs> um, wh why more. did we lose Osama bin Laden? And what's the connection between Pakistan and Afghanistan? OK, those are two separate questions. Osama bin Laden, um, I actually think, is a false problem. I don't think the issue has to do with one individual. I think the issue has to do with, I mean, I can really fade back for that pass if you want me to, which you don't. But um, I'm president of the United States on September 12, 2001. Do you guys remember, we were lining up to, to cut, you know, to like open our veins. We were so desperate to make some kind of sacrifice. And we were told, go out and shop. Right? If I had been president of the United States, faced with a country that was dying to sacrifice, I would have said, you know what, I'm going to triple the price of gasoline. Because if we get off oil, we can close our bases in Saudi Arabia, and that removes a lot of the argument that Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden ha has. You know? And for national security purposes, it is necessary for us to break the petro petroleum habit. And on you know, September 2001, I think we Americans would have been ready to do that. Triple the price of gasoline, devote that money to R&D for re uh, renewable resources, um, public transportation for every American city above a uh, population of 100,000, you know, things like that. And so those are the issues we need to be grappling with. <laughs> It, 
it creates jobs too. Now we may be seeing ourselves moving in some of that, those directions now, but again, we lost eight years and we're not gonna do it as dramatically as we could have then. And I think those are the issues that make much more of a difference than the one individual Osama bin Laden. He's not relevant to the problem, really. He's a, he's a symbol, he's a figurehead. Um, uh, secondly, Pakistan, that's another very long story, but the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan um, is a contentious one. And Pakistan is a funny country that really suffers from a kind of paranoia complex. And it's a country that, um, it's a wonderfully rich and vibrant and diverse country that unfortunately has suffered from domination by its military. And I think what's going on in Pakistan right now is the military is trying to maintain a pretext for basically owning the country. The joke about Pakistan is most states have a military and Pakistan, in the case of Pakistan, the military has a state. Um, and, and so what you do is you try to gin up pretexts for a continuing domination by the military, which is to say you gin up threats. And the biggest threat that you can gin up is India. India does not practically represent any kind of a threat to Pakistan. India doesn't want Pakistan. India is doing just fine, thank you very much. But then what happens is the Pakistani military intelligence agency foments, for example, bombings in Mumbai and leaves its fingerprints very visibly all over those bombings. What is the objective? The objective is to anger India to the point that India might just start to constitute a threat to Pakistan, in which case the Pakistani military has a rationale to maintain its dominance over the government. And part of that picture is that it sees Afghanistan as its kind of backyard, as, as the place where it fades back to, to, to pass from. And so there's been this desire on the part of the Pakistani military to control Afghanistan in whole or in part directly or by usually by proxy. And that is a policy that really has not changed very much to this, to this day. Are you sure that's all we have time for? I would love to go on, but we want to uh, thank you for this great presentation tonight. Thank you.